I want to welcome everyone to uh, this very special topics uh, that it's called uh, Confronting Bias uh, in the Scientific Culture. Um, and in previous years, two SDB committees uh, are tasked to organize uh, symposia in our workshops for the annual meeting. The first one is the Professional Development and Education Committee. It has been organizing numerous education symposia and workshops, including the uh, very popular um, uh, boot camp, which I hear it went very well, uh, even in its virtual form uh, yesterday. Uh, they are uh, responsible, that committee is responsible for uh, organizing many professional development and educational activities. And I want to introduce the current chair of the PDC, and this is my colleague, Nicole Theodosia. Uh, that you can see here, I think. Um, the second uh, committee um, is the Inclusion and Outreach Committee. It's uh, relatively uh, newer, but we have brought in the past annual meetings, uh, worked uh, um, seminars on topics including implicit bias, discrimination and harassment in academia, as well as in the research environment. Uh, but and, it's, and we're also now tasked to bring you the theme tables, which I strongly recommend. Uh, I hope everybody signed up. Well, this year we decided to join forces and actually organize a, a symposia on a topic of biases in the scientific endeavor. And one may ask why. Why do we consider this topic such an important topic so as to dedicate a special symposia? Um, you all know that today science uh, confronts a public crisis of trust. Uh, from the Oval Office in Washington and on news media around the world, scientific consensus on vaccines, climate change, uh, COVID-19, uh, even dental flossing <laughs> um, is being uh, questioned. And so why, why so much distrust in science? Well, what we would like to do is flip the question and ask, why do we trust science? Um, after all, um, we, trained as scientists, uh, are very keen to avoid bias so as to not threaten our ideals, uh, our rationality, our objectivity, our transparency, but we're humans, um, and therefore we're not objective. Uh, we do not hold neutral attitudes towards any of our research. Um, as scientists, we continue to work under the influence of our implicit bias, or non-implicit biases. And so what I like to do is um, share my slide. Um, let's see. And it's, uh, now we go to slideshow. And so this is our, uh, the first slide of our, uh, sorry, I should have put uh, the picture of uh, Nicole and myself and then our, our two speakers. Um, so as I was saying, but as scientists, we continue to work under the influence of our implicit or non-implicit bias. And in fact, Claude Bernard, who is considered the father of modern experimental physiology, as well as internal homeostasis, he famously was quoted as saying, uh, the scientist entering the laboratory cannot hang up his personal values, preferences, assumptions, and motivations like an overcoat, okay? And Sandra Harding, a philosopher of science and epistemologist, uh, she took it further. She said, how we view issues depends to a great extent on our social position. And in fact, she said, our personal experiences such as wealth or poverty, privilege or disadvantage, maleness or femaleness, uh, queerness of heteronormativity, disable, disability or able-bodiedness and culture, we come with those and we cannot but be influenced by those perspectives. So her solution towards, for scientists uh, uh, to increase the strength of our objectivity, she said, the scientific community needs to increase its diversity of the members. Um, Another uh, peer uh, in, uh, of hers in uh, the philosophy of science is Helen Longina. And I just want to read and for all of you to read this quote. And she says, with a greater diversity, um, with a greater diverse community of scientists, 
the greater the openness of the scientific community, the stronger is its protocol for supporting free and open debate, the greater degree of objectivity that it may be able to achieve as individual biases and assumptions are outed by the community. And so her solution was to actually have what we're having now, and that is uh, all-inclusive uh, debate and uh, discussions uh, where our biases come out and, um, and then challenge each other's questions and our biases. Um, as our SDB president, uh, Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado said earlier in his introduction, um, he said developmental biology today is, is largely restricted, uh, perhaps, to only studying a few uh, stages of life and using a very, very um, restrictive number of experimental model systems. And so the question is, how objective is our knowledge? And so uh, the more we bring, the greater diversity that we bring in techniques, in, in our community, uh, in opinions and representations, uh, that may be less, uh, we may become uh, less uh, biased. And feminism uh, was actually uh, a great uh, contribution to science being less um, biased. Uh, I believe, lastly, that this topic is uh, not commonly found in most scientific societies, uh, presentations or symposia, but it is very, very important. Um, the, the more we open up to these discussions, uh, the more we're likely to generate more meaningful knowledge, as well as to do a better uh, training of our future scientists. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mary Alice, uh, Alice Scott, Dr. Mary Alice Scott, sorry. Um, she's a dear colleague of mine at New Mexico State University. She's a medical anthropologist, and she actually was key in bringing many of these topics uh, for me to learn more about and to be more uh, knowledgeable of. And ever since, in the last couple of years, I've read many of the books of these uh, women philosophers, and uh, she's gonna talk to us about breaking the culture bias in science. And as I also noticed is that anthropologists, social scientists like to cross their arms in their pictures. And so us bench scientists don't do that that much. But anyways, so with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and then have uh, Mary Alice now stay, take over. Thank you everybody for coming. But uh, one quick question that I, I mean, one quick statement is we would like for our two speakers to deliver their uh, presentations and then please write or submit your questions in chat and then we will address them all as a panel. Okay, thank you and welcome everybody for coming. Okay, take it over, Mary Alice. Could you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so thank you, Graciela, for that introduction. Um, th this, um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk um, across disciplines about some of the work that I've been doing in anthropology, and I'm really excited to have some conversations about how the work that I do might apply to some of the work that you all are doing in developmental biology. Um, I will say we, you know, there are different disciplinary cultures. I'll talk a little bit about that today. One of the disciplinary cultures in anthropology, other than crossing our arms in photos, is that we read papers. And I'm going to do my best to um, not not read, but that's what we do. Um, so it's what I'm used to doing. Um, so today I'm going to talk about culture and science and why I think it's critical for scientists, anthropologists included, to take time to examine the cultures we create in our disciplines, in our departments, and in our labs. And I'm going to talk about this both in terms of what I think it means for how we teach and who we teach, and also what I think it means for the science that we produce. So before I get into the details, I want to first preface this by saying that I um, very much support um, generally scientific endeavors because of the ways that we've advanced knowledge and the ways that we've improved lives. And I do consider myself 
um, to be a part of a scientific community. And so I hope that you'll be able to view my critiques of um, scientific culture today as offered in support of the work that you all do. And I think we can do even better work that's more inclusive and more innovative if we take a step back and examine our practices as scientists. So that's what I'm going to talk some about today. So the first thing I'm going to do today is to tell you what I mean when I say culture so that we're all on the same page about that. And then I'll talk about my research on the hidden curriculum in medical education. And then finally, I'll offer some examples from some other science and technology studies that Graciela um, introduced us to um, just a couple of minutes ago. Um, and, and these are, are scholars who've made similar critiques to the, to the ones that I make in medical education. And I'll conclude with a few strategies or at least some questions that we, um, that we can ask that have been helpful for me in my ongoing work in medical education to both uncover and address um, hidden biases that may be present in our work. So in anthropology, we, um, we have a never ending debate about what culture means and what it doesn't mean and whether it can really be defined. Um, but all of us typically have working definitions, whether we explicitly state them or not. And so my working definition of culture that I use in my research is that culture is a shared set of um, values, beliefs, and practices within a group that gets taught to new members, usually through informal pressures, examples, role modeling, and conventions about how one should act. And there are also some more formal ways that culture gets communicated, for example, through regulations or through enforcement of those regulations. Um, but even in those instances, those underlying values and beliefs are often very subtly communicated. And so the way that I, um, that I study uh, culture within medical education is, through looking at what, what a lot of researchers call the hidden curriculum. And you all may be familiar with this term already, but for those who are not, the hidden curriculum as I use it is the implicit lessons that are embedded in the learning culture that are often unintended. And this hidden curriculum often conflicts with an explicit formal curriculum, particularly regarding ethics and professionalism. And it's distinct from what we might think about as an informal curriculum, which would be something like where one learns by apprenticeship or one learns by doing. The hidden curriculum doesn't just exist in places that we've designated as specifically places to learn either, um, like in teaching labs or in classrooms. It also exists in our workplaces where we're constantly learning from our colleagues, um, from, from our students, from other people that we're working with um, all the time, whether we're really aware of it or not. So to explain the hidden curriculum, I, I want to start with an example from an anthropologist named Jules Henry. In one of his books, he described a game of spelling baseball in an elementary school where he was conducting research. And he observed that the teacher first chose two children to be the team captains, and then she instructed the team captains to take turns choosing their teammates from among the rest of the class. And once all the children had been selected for a team, the teacher instructed the first team to go up to bat. She called out spelling words to the team and each batter had to spell their word. If they spelled it correctly, it was a base hit. If they spelled it incorrectly, it was an out. And at three outs, team two went up to bat and it continued in that way. So the formal curriculum here is spelling and the teacher's making it more fun by turning it into a game. But she's teaching a lot more than spelling in at least in Jules Henry's analysis and I think in, in many anthropologists analyses as well. So Henry called the formal teaching the message, what you're intending to communicate. And the hidden curriculum is the noise or the other stuff that you're communicating that isn't in line with the message. So some of the hidden curriculum or the noise that Henry pointed out was that learning is competitive, that some children are better because they, than others because they already know the answers. And making a mistake should be punished by an out. So the noise or hidden curriculum is often what transmits cultural values. Hidden curriculum doesn't have to be negative, but it's at the very least, it's often unexamined. In this example, learning may actually be hindered because children are discouraged from demonstrating what they don't yet know and are punished by being out when they misspell a word or when they make a mistake. 
hidden curriculum isn't limited to explicit teaching contexts. In my research in medical education, we've identified hidden curriculum within the institution that would happen whether or not there was a graduate medical education program there. For example, one of the observations we made during our research was that physicians commonly use the term frequent flyers to describe patients who presented to the emergency room on a regular basis and had to be admitted to the hospital. The term is most often used in a derogatory way and alongside other discussion about the patient that identifies that patient as less deserving of care. We heard physicians say things like, Mr. X just refuses to take his medications. He's one of our most famous frequent flyers when introducing a patient to another healthcare professional. We observed physicians and other healthcare professionals rolling their eyes when one of their frequent flyers showed up on their list for rounds. The concern here is that the physician may be unknowingly providing inferior care to patients they've labeled, infrequent, they've labeled frequent flyers, and they communicate that to others around them, whether learners or colleagues. They communicate that these patients are not worth the time or effort because they will just be back here again. These learners and colleagues then learn that it is okay to give a different quality of care to different patients and that it is okay to quickly label a patient without asking further questions about why this person may be unable to take medications, for example. So the culture becomes one that perpetuates bias against a particular group of patients. Another example that is more specifically from a formal teaching learning context is the requirements from the accrediting body for graduate medical education. Residents are required to have a certain number of patient encounters in their outpatient clinic to do a certain number of different types of procedures to see a certain number of patients in different settings like assisted living centers. And this list that I have on the slide is, is just an example of some of those numbers and hours that residents need to accumulate. And so residents have to meet these numbers in order to graduate. Formally, these policies are about competency. But underneath that formal policy is a lesson that if you just do something a certain number of times, you will be competent. So rather than focusing on getting good at something, these, these requirements sometimes encourage residents to instead focus on logging numbers. The requirements teach that quantity is equivalent to quality. And faculty in the program where we did our research reported that they know this isn't the case. One resident can deliver three babies and be competent, and another may deliver 20 and still not have the skills to, needed to attend normal low-risk deliveries. So while several faculty expressed frustration about this incongruence during the course of our research, they still felt that they had to focus on making sure that residents get their numbers so that they can graduate from the program. The hidden curriculum can also be even more subtle and enter into our teaching and learning and professional environments through the influence of broader cultural perspectives that we bring with us. And the anthropologist Emily Martin, who Graciela introduced, I think, in the beginning, um, has done extensive work demonstrating how these cultural perspectives may limit the science we're able to do. And I'll talk more about her work in a minute, but the point I want to make right now is that part of scientific culture may be a belief in the possibility of objectivity that might close off questioning of the, about the influence of culture. So for the past few years, I've been thinking about what this means for how I and, and we um, as a scientific community both teach and do science. So I want to pose some questions and offer some strategies for addressing, addressing bias that I hope we can continue to think about together um, throughout the, this conference and, and, and afterwards too. So the first question is, is it possible for scientists to do better science by reflecting on and potentially challenging accepted norms and definitions of objectivity? And this question comes from my reading of Sandra Harding's work, um, Objectivity and Diversity, where Harding distinguishes between what she calls strong objectivity and weak objectivity. Weak objectivity is based on the assumption that science is necessarily value-free because it is science. Um, and perhaps more subtly that being value free is the goal of science. And she looks historically at scientific research that has now been demonstrated to be biased, often because someone from outside the norm of scientific researchers looked at it and, and could see those biases in a way that scientific, the, sci the researchers couldn't see it. One example from anthropology is the debunking of the man the hunter theory. Um, without going into details here, the idea was that hunting was a male activity on which human psychology, biology, and culture is based. 
the anthropologist Sally Slocum wrote an article in the 1970s um, when feminist anthropology was really just um, beginning to um, have, have a voice in the field of anthropology and she challenged this idea. How is it possible, she asked, for a theory that leaves out half of the human species to be accepted as truth? And she developed an alternative model of woman the gatherer that serves as a really scathing critique of the man the hunter theory and also the gender bias that existed in anthropology at the time. And what she said was that part of the reason that the man the hunter theory seemed to make sense was one, that most anthropologists were male, and two, that as male anthropologists, they mostly, um, and eth ethnographers, they mostly only had access to male activities. And so the theory was based on the activities of only half the human population. So maybe we solved that problem a long time ago, or maybe there are plenty of hidden biases and not so hidden ones still present in our research, even in bench science. Harding developed her concept of strong objectivity from this kind of historical analysis of scientific research and her concern with current biases in research. So she argues that in order to obtain more objective accounts of nature and social relations, researchers should start off research from outside the dominant conceptual frameworks. So this strong objectivity refocuses our attention to the actual real practice of science rather than the way it is supposed to be. It also challenges us not to assume that science is value free just because we are using the scientific method or other conventional practices of science. And finally, it draws our attention to how we admit and train new scientists into research practices that advance particular values and interests. One example that came up recently in my work in graduate medical education is the basis for clinical assessments that use race as a factor in determining appropriate treatment. And there are a number of these assessments, and I'm just going to talk about one, which is a calculator that's used to estimate the risk of death and other complications during cardiac surgery. The calculators include race and ethnicity as one factor in determining risk. And this is based on studies that have reported observed differences in surgical outcomes among different racial and ethnic groups. But the problem is that the mechanism explaining these differences has not been studied and is therefore unknown. What this calculator generally outputs is higher risks for patients of color than for white patients. And what that means is that patients of color, regardless of their clinical presentation, may be steered away from needed surgery. So one strategy for addressing potential bias is to start recognizing when you take objectivity for granted and ask instead what assumptions you might be making that come from either your own personal cultural background or from how you were trained to become a member of your profession and how you were trained to read evidence. So the second question that I want to ask and think about is, is it important to examine the slippage between the words we use and the meanings we ascribe to them? So I want to turn to the anthropologist Emily Martin here. Martin's work is in social studies of science and technology, and she focuses in particular on the perhaps um, unintended consequence of the use of metaphor in research. She understands metaphor to be a culturally shaped method of communication that biological scientists regularly use without necessarily recognizing that they are using it to describe what they discover about the world. So in her article, The Egg and the Sperm, how science has constructed a romance based on stereotypical male-female roles, Martin analyzes medical physiology textbooks comparing how they describe male reproductive physiology versus female reproductive physiology. I should say this article was written in the 90s, um, so I'm using it as an example of metaphor and it may not necessarily reflect the way that current physiology textbooks are written. Um, she gives a number of examples of the way that metaphor creeps in and either reinforces or draws on stereotypes about gender. So prior to the mid 1980s, the egg was assumed to be passive while the sperm was assumed to be active. Martin argues that the metaphors of femininity and masculinity were the norm in textbooks describing the activities of each. And she summarizes, the egg is seen as large and passive. It does not move or journey, but passively is transported, is swept, uh, or even in popular account, drifts along the fallopian tube. In utter contrast, sperm are small, streamlined, and invariably active. They go on a journey, they deliver their genes to the egg and activate the developmental program of the egg. 
and have a velocity that is often remarked upon. Their tails are strong and efficiently powered. Then scientists figured out that the egg actually does things and that sperm might actually not be that strong. How much sooner might that have happened if scientists were reflecting on what their metaphors were making unnoticeable in their, in their work? What breakthroughs and discoveries might occur now if we really looked closely at the ways that we use metaphor in our current work? So paying attention to language is an additional strategy that may lead us closer to Harding's strong objectivity. So the last question I want to address is, can or does scientific training limit the possibilities of science by training difference out of trainees and making them more like us? And by that, I mean by the, the mentoring or teaching local community that a student is entering into. When I began developing my first research project in medical education, I had a conversation with the program director of a residency program in my region. We were discussing different ideas for research when he said, you know what I really want to know? I want to know if I'm harming residents by acculturating them into medicine. We discussed some existing research about the culture of medicine and concerns that other scholars have raised about the ways that the values of medicine may harm practitioners. For example, one of the areas of hidden curriculum in medicine is that physicians should be self-sacrificing, always putting themselves ahead of others. Physicians who work extra hours, come in to see their patients in the middle of the night, are always on call. Those are the physicians that are viewed as heroes. But only certain people can really fit this role. One of the residents I interviewed in my first study of medical education said this about her experience being acculturated into medicine. In medical school, I was standing in someone's cancerous body fluid that had spilled over their abdomen and soaked through my scrubs. Sometimes it's kind of surreal, and you're like, I'm in a puddle of his cancer. He's dying, and his family didn't know, and I think he's going to die right now. Stuff like that, you just constantly go through it like a train. I'm not the first person to say med school can be dehumanizing because you have to fit into a culture a certain way to perform like a robot and be able to handle certain things. And then you get to residency and you're kind of at the bottom again and you realize how much you don't know. It's really hard on relationships. I thought I was doing something for the betterment of humanity and come to find out that I'm being selfish without being there for my kids. Now my kids are having problems in school. It really hurts the people around you. It's not just your sacrifice, it's everybody else's. Rather than being a self-sacrificing hero, this resident felt that she had failed everyone. She struggled to see herself as a good doctor because she could not uphold that standard. And this caused me to ask the question of who chooses to go to medical school, knowing that this is the kind of environment that they're gonna be entering into. Who gets through medical school to residency? Who following residency becomes a practicing physician? And does this culture of medicine that we are trying to acculturate um, students and residents into, does this limit the diversity of perspectives, backgrounds, experiences, and sensibilities of those who practice medicine? I think it does. And I think this may be true of other areas of science as well. So to conclude, I think we do ourselves, our fields, and our communities a disservice if we don't examine the ways that the biases we bring into our work and our teaching may limit the capacity of our fields. And I think it's worthwhile to think about our hidden curriculum, assumptions we make about objectivity, the consequences of the language we use, and the effects of our methods of training and our cultures of practice on those we're training to, to become part of our professions. I think we do better science and we create a fundamentally more diverse scientific community when we consider these things. And I'm looking forward to a discussion about how this applies in developmental biology more specifically in the rest of the symposium. So thank you again for inviting me and I will um, turn it over to Nicole, I believe. Great, thank you so much, Mary Alice. That was really fantastic. It really makes us think about um, how we present ourselves, how we present our field when we're mentoring um, trainees in the research lab, when we're mentoring them in the classroom and teaching them the words we use. Um, and we've had a really great response so far. We have had a number of questions come in. So um, we're gonna actually wait and hold up on answering questions until after our second speaker. So please keep um, sending those questions in the Q&A and uh, we will get to them as soon as we are done with our presentation part. 
Okay. So on to our next presenter and let me just share my screen with you. Okay. Can you see that all right? Okay, so I got thrown a little bit of a softball by Graciela, um, and I am uh, happy to introduce Scott Gilbert, who needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at Swarthmore College and a distinguished professor at the University of Helsinki. He has um, written three textbooks that are currently in print, including Developmental Biology, which is in his 12th edition. And he received the Service Award for Education and Outreach at the Pan American Society for Evolutionary Developmental Biology and the Victor Hamburger Prize for Excellence in Education, just to name two among numerous awards he re he's received. Scott's research examined the evolutionary and developmental origin of the turtle shell. And probably his greatest honor was having a former student name a newly discovered species of turtle fossil after him. Uh, Saxocallus Gilberti. I hope I got that right. Um, Scott was my undergraduate mentor, and he, along with my other mentors, shaped the way I think about science and the world around me. Scott joins us on this panel as someone who was shaped by his mentors as well. These mentors educated him not only in science, but also broader themes such as gender, race, and equity. His first scientific mentor in high school was Jean Cook, a black hematologist at Albert Einstein Medical um, College of Medicine. In graduate school, his scientific advisor was Barbara Mijon, who works on um, X inactivation, which led her to argue that women have an advantage over men in coping with diseases due to X inactivation. And this is still relevant today when you look at the gender outcomes uh, trends in uh, COVID cases. Scott also received a master's in the history of science with Donna Haraway, a leading scholar in contemporary ecofeminism and author of numerous writings on science, technology, culture, and feminism. These strong mentors shaped Scott's worldview, and I can attest that in teaching, Scott always made his students aware of the works of scientists that were left out of the textbooks. Every time I speak or email with Scott, I learn something new. And although he did identify himself to me as a white cishet male boomer, I think we're gonna learn a lot from him today. So thank you, Scott, for joining us. Um, and welcome, and I will let you take over. Okay, now I need to find out where's my screen share here. Screen share. You got it. Well, let's see. I'm trying. Uh, okay, here we go. Try this. Try this. Okay, we're on. So first, I really want to thank Nicole and Graciela for their vote of confidence that I could do this. And I thank Mary Alice for her excellent talk. I can't talk with any authority on black brown or women's bodies. So I begin with the front page of the New York Times Sunday Review from last week. Carolyn Randall Walla Williams is a black woman poet whose biological ancestors include Edmund Pettus, a Confederate general and Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. I highly recommend the article that uh, uh, Dr. Williams wrote, which is free online. I've written, I've rewritten this talk after the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmoud Arbery. The quest to rid science of gender and racial bias has really taken on new urgency. And I feel the need to talk about systemic racism and sexism, that racism and sexism that is endemic in our culture, not that which is added to it, but that which is part of its very being. And one of the great icons probably the best icon of systemic racism in biology is the statue of Teddy Roosevelt that is presently being removed from the entrance of the American Museum of Natural History. 
The statue is a monument that can be seen as normalizing genocide and slavery, and it denigrates, in my opinion, the memory of Theodore Roosevelt. But the American Museum of Natural History had indeed been a bulwark of racist science in America. The statue was placed there by the museum's president, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was a paleontologist, a white supremacist, a eugenicist, and the person who wrote the laudatory preface for that Bible of white supremacism, Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race. And I don't use the term Bible loosely. That is what Hitler called this book. Anyone interested in the normative racism and sexism in the early American Museum of Natural History should look at Donna Haraway's book, Primate Visions. I happen to love the museum. I spent much of my childhood there, but I'm not sorry to see this statue removed. Okay, this title slide that I had said that I will discuss cow dung. Cow dung is a technical term coined by Conrad Hal Waddington, the same person who coined the term epigenetics. It stands for the collective wisdom of the dominant group. And the collective wisdom of the dominant group that has characterized Western science and the Western world since the early Greek philosophers has been the great chain of being. And so I will discuss today the great chain of being and how it became racist and sexist. So in one thing you have to remember is that the great chain of being was our major way of organizing nature. And it starts off with Aristotle, about 350 before the Common Era. And if you look at this diagram, what you find here is that there's inanimate matter at the bottom and inanimate matter, the rocks, the soil, turns into the lower plants. The lower plants then are stratified by the higher plants. And then above them in the scale of being are the zoophytes, those which bridge animal plants, such as the jellyfish, the sponge, ascidians. And then you have the lower animals, the mollusks, the arthropods, going up through crustaceans, reptiles, birds, the cetaceans, mammals, and finally, man. Now, according to Plato, there was no breaks in this Aristotelian chain of being. St. Thomas Aquinas normalized it for Christianity and his doctrine of souls. It was a static hierarchical ladder ordained by God. And so in the 1500s, so we're talking you know, 2,000 years later, you still see the great chain of being here, sometimes called the scala natura, the scale of nature, ladder of nature, where there's non-being things, plants, animals, and then the orders of humanity, commoners, monarchs, and then the celestial orders, angels, and God. There was a big debate over whether God was on the chain or above it. Then Charles Bonnet, 1745, one of the leading French uh, biologists, uh, talks about the same order. Plants, then you have those organisms which are in between animals and plants, the sea anemones, jellyfish, insects, mollusks, snakes, fish, birds, and then of course quadrupeds. And then you get the monkeys, orangutans, and humans. So there's this great chain of being, and this chain of being was divinely ordained. Those of you who've studied Shakespeare probably read the Elizabethan world picture, which goes into detail into what the Elizabethans thought in the 1600s. And it was the great chain of being, where you have minerals, metals, stones, then you have plants, trees, domesticated animals, wild animals, men, and the groups of men, nobles, princes, kings, and then the celestials again, moon, stars, demons, angels, God. The chain was a series of hierarchical links, matter at the bottom, God at the top. Now, Aristotle showed that females were really, uh, uh, they, they were kind of lower than the men because women were not fully developed. Remember, Aristotle was the first known embryologist. His embryology is amazing. He was the first person to detail what the chick embryo looked like. Truly incredible embryology. But 
his interpretation was that of the Greek of his time. Uh, sorry, Nicole. Uh, women were not fully developed. The telos of the human embryo was the male. Not the male and the female, it was the male. We must look upon the female character as being a sort of natural deficiency because heat is needed for development. Females were defective males because they were not fully baked. Women's brains were smaller, less developed because they stopped developing early. Women merely provided the matter for the embryo. This was the menstrual blood. The male, however, was the generator of the embryo. Like if you were making a bed, the woman provides the lumber, but the man is the carpenter who gives that lumber form. As Aristotle said in his generation of animals, the first efficient or moving cause to which belong the definition and form is better and more divine in nature than the material on which it works. The principle of movement, whereby that which come into being is male, is better, and is more divine. The female is matter. So matter is feminine, rationality masculine. So we have this great chain of being, and on it, pure materiality at the bottom, female passivity, pure rationality at the top with God, it's male, and it has agency. And you could look at the sperm and egg traditionally in this way, as Emily Martin and the biology and gender study group did. Okay. So what justifies racism being put on to this, uh, on to this model? Okay, now here we have to look at the, uh, oops, I'm not, uh, this is not, my slides are not changing. Okay, I'll get it this way. We're going to talk about Raymond Lilly, who is beatified, is a doctor illuminatus of the Catholic Church, medieval theologian, and he said that the distinguishing mark of being human and thus being made in God's image is that one is receptive to Christ's teaching. Okay, so only humans would be receptive to Christ's teaching. That makes us different. That makes us who we are, except some humans are not really receptive to Christ's teaching. And this included conversos, the Jewish, uh, the Jews who converted to, to Spanish Christianity, who wanted to remain in Spain, but had to convert to Catholicism. But long-time Christian families did not trust that these conversions were sincere. The new term, limpieza de sangre, the purity of the blood, was used to mean Christian ancestry. And it was used as a requirement for employment in many cases. Jewish blood made one resistant to accepting Christ, and therefore Jews were not as fully human as Christians. Official policy in many Spanish cities was that Jews were less than fully human. And Fredrickson, in his Racism, A Short History, says, 16th and 17th century Spain is critical to the study of Western racism because its attitudes and practices serve as a kind of segue between the religious intolerance of the Middle Ages and the naturalistic racism of the modern era. Innocent savages who embraced Spanish civilization and Catholicism did not carry impure blood. Discrimination against Indians persisted after they were baptized but it was based on culture more than ancestry. Mestizos who adopted Spanish ways could be admitted to religious orders that excluded Jewish conversos. This was not a minor problem. Bartolome de las Casas had a huge debate with Juan Ginés de Sepulveda over whether the Indians of the New World were truly human. De las Casas says Indians were human. They had rational faculties, they lived, however, under Aristotle's notion of natural law, but they were fellow humans ripe for conversion. Whereas Genus de Sepulveda had said Indians are not in full possession of rationality, they belong in Aristotle's set of natural slaves, like animals, and they were somewhere between humans and animals. Well, Delicasus won, but geopolitics prevailed. Christians could not enslave the Indians. They were supposed to convert them. This was sometimes honored, sometimes not. However, one could buy people who were already enslaved because in that way, one was not depriving them of their liberty. 
Africans were thought of as being slaves by nature, as natural slaves, as they were sold by Berbers and later by Portuguese merchants. Again, Aristotle. It is not difficult to show that there are natural slaves, that there are people as different from others as body is from soul or beast from human. So this was based on intellectual ability. Most non-Greeks fell into this category, so did all women. Slavery would be just and beneficial, he said, to both the slave and the slave's owner. University of Virginia uh, professor Oganayaki says, by asserting that conversos, although Christian, were inferior due to their ethnicity, Iberian proto-racism developed the idea of racial essentialism. And that's a critical idea. Moreover, the classification of black Africans as Aristotelian natural slaves Indians as innocent savages living under natural law, and the Spanish as the defenders and champions of the one true faith created a color-coded racial hierarchy. In the Enlightenment, all European men were equal, no one else. The great chain must have all gradations and classification was based on the degree of excellence pertaining to the European values of rationality, love of liberty and beauty. So people like Voltaire and Kant who are associated with the philosophical enlightenment believed that blacks were different than whites. To Voltaire, blacks came from a different origin. They were qualitatively different than whites, but for Kant, they were just quantitatively different. Kant said, humanity is at its greatest perfection in the race of whites. The yellow Indians do have a meager talent. The Negroes are far below them and at the lowest point to some of the American peoples. This was part of Enlightenment philosophy. Now, in America, you have such things as Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion was a rebellion of black and white workers against the government of Jamestown in Virginia. They burnt down the city, 1675. Bacon takes over. They run the government for a while. They fight against the Indians because they want to take over Indian land. Eventually, uh, Bacon dies, his government falls apart, the British restore normal uh, aristocracy there. Southern landowners make laws separating blacks and whites because the blacks and whites, when they unified, are really powerful. And they made pass laws which created the hereditary black slavery with landless whites being over being able to overlord over blacks. Christian, by the way, at this time equaled whites, even though a lot of the blacks had converted. Blacks and Indians, for instance, were told that they could not take a Christian white person to court. Dorothy Roberts, a professor at University of Pennsylvania said, making race a biological concept served an important ideological function in revolutionary America. Biological differences were essential to justifying the enslavement of Africans in a nation founded on the radical commitment to liberty, equality, and natural rights. Race is a political category disguised as a biological one. This was reified, made into real science by uh, uh, Morton uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who had looked at the si who had made a theory based on core measurements of size using slave skulls rather than African skulls, biased interpretations of data to put Caucasians at the apex of humanity, Negroes at the bottom, and all the other races between them. Recent research showed that he has a conscious bias, had a conscious bias to make the Negro brain seem smaller than the white brain and therefore to lack intelligence. Darwin was very suspect of Morton's work and writes to Lyle, who was not that suspect, there was a want of exactness in the manner Morton gives to the facts. In conclusion, therefore, I do not think Dr. Morton as a safe man to quote from. However, when Morton died in 1851, the Charleston Medical Journal noted that we of the South should consider him as our benefactor for aiding most materially in giving the Negro his true position as an inferior race. So this was, again, 1800s, just before evolution, uh, and this was uh, um, Dr. Morton. So we have here the great chain of being, 
with the white male on top. Now you might say, hold it, I don't believe this. Uh, this is not the way you know, I think. I think in this branched evolution, uh, where you have in this diagram, uh, the human and the tick. Matter of fact, the tick might be a bit higher than the human in this diagram from Oslo in the 1930s. You might say, you know, I'm really, uh, you know, I, I, I allow all sorts of things. I have this round table view of phylogeny, such as King Arthur's round table, which was made so that none of the barons that sat at it could claim precedence over the other. And yeah, here's Metazoa right here around two o'clock and you could hardly see where humans are. I'm a pluralist. But yet, the great chain of being entered into evolutionary biology. It's what Paul Krugman calls a zombie idea, a view that's been thoroughly refuted by a mountain of empirical evidence, but nevertheless refuses to die. Heckel, here's the great chain of being right up here in the base of the, through the tree. The main axis of the tree is the great chain of being going from the one celled animals all the way up to man. And all the other animals are actually parts of the human embryo. They're truncated visions of the human embryo. The entire animal kingdom is a truncation of human development through the law of terminal addition. An organism evolves by following the development of its ancestors and then adds another stage. So we have the laws of correspondence truncation, but the law I'm talking about is terminal addition so that the ontogeny of the highest member, man, is then seen, the animal kingdom is then seen as different parts of that man's development. So ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That's what it means. The animal kingdom is a truncation of human development. And we see this uh, in anthropology so that uh, Carl Vogt says, in the brain of the Negro, the central gyri are like that of a seven month fetus. The secondary gyri are still less marked. By its rounded apex and less developed posterior lobe, the Negro brain resembles that of our children. And by the protuberance of the posterior lobe, that of our females. The grown Negro partakes as regards his intellectual abilities of the nature of the child, the female, and the senile white. So white males are superior in brain development to women and blacks. Women and blacks are like children. And notice he assumes the readership is white and male. He talks about our children, our females. Carl Vogt was no slouch. Uh, he was well recognized as a scientist. There's a, uh, uh, there's a boulevard in, in Switzerland named for him. He was quite the scientist of his time. So animals were the stages of the human embryo. Women's and blacks were underdeveloped white males. In the static great chain of being, inequalities were due to God. You had your office of existence by divine will. In the evolutionary chain of being, inequalities were the result of natural selection. You had your office of existence due to nature. And the chain is still very much with us. Here is an ad from a Continental Bank, 1988. And this is what they say evolution is. And they conclude, we've evolved, yes, but considering what we've evolved from, we'll have no trouble standing on our own two feet. And here is the white male banker at the apex of evolution. From Monera to the white male. Still used for humans. Here is Heckel's diagram showing everything from the mandrel going up through the orders of apes to the various races of humans to the white male human, the Apollo Belvedere indeed. Look at what it sees in this ad for strategy in 1990. One sees a woman of color, a man of color, a white woman, a white male, and then you will have this white Superman coming in to stand at the uh, best vector of the time. They pulled that ad very quickly. One also sees it in the hierarchy of sciences. And I'm saying this is, we still think this way. So when you think of sciences, and if I were to ask you what are the hierarchy of sciences, you'd probably say, well, there's math on top, then there's physics, chemistry, and biology. And indeed, I think that's the way we think. And that is the great chain of being. Biology deals with dirty matter. Chemistry deals with purified matter. Physics deals with idealized matter and mathematics celebrates that it is beyond matter and material analogy. We could put in the 
disciplines that uh, link these. Molecular bio is seen as the highest biology and it links to biochem, which is seen as the lowest chemistry. Physical chemistry links chemistry with physics. Theoretical physics takes physics and brings it to mathematics. It's also gendered. You have the hard sciences. What a great masculine metaphor, which is precise quantitation and the soft sciences, less quantitation being feminine. So when we think of physics as being more masculine, a harder science than biology, we actually are invoking the sexualized great chain of being. XKCD did a beautiful cartoon of this. Fields arranged according to purity. Sociology is applied psych. Psych is just applied biology. Biology just applied chemistry, which is just physics. It's nice to be on top. And then the mathematician saying, oh, hey, I didn't see you guys all the way down there. Yeah, it's very much part of our way of thinking. However, as we know, there is no constellation of genes given to specific groups. You know, the whole notion of what is a race, what is a subspecies, needs you have to identify a constellation of factors, of traits that are specific to that group. There are none. We all know that human beings are 99.9% .9 identical in the genetic makeup. Uh, we also know that there's more diversity within populations than between populations. One of the best example is that James Watson in the first genome sequence has an allele for cytochrome P450 that is an Asian allele. It's found in only 3% of Europeans, found in 50% of the Chinese population. There's lots of diversity between populations. The entire range of human variation is found in Africa. There's more diversity between a person from the Congo and a person from Ethiopia than from the Congo to France. From a genetic perspective, according to Deborah Boldick, a genetic anthropologist, non-Africans are essentially a subset of Africans. So if you step out of the human condition and look at it from perhaps the condition of an other organism, white, black, man, woman, straight, gay, Catholic, Muslim, American, Mexican, we all taste like chicken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so let's get started and welcome to this workshop on strategies to lessen biases in science. I'm Nicole Theodosiu, Chair of the Professional Development and Education Committee at SDB. And along with my colleague, Graciela Uges, welcome you to this workshop. Um, on Thursday, we hosted a special symposium on confronting bias in scientific culture. From anthropologist, Mary Alice Scott, we learned about the hidden curriculum and the implicit lessons embedded in our classrooms and research labs that can hinder learning for many. Scott Gilbert gave us a history lesson and how systemic racism and sexism get established and justified by science. In this workshop, Mary Alice and Scott are joined by a broader panel of scientists with professional and personal experiences in finding solutions to confronting bias. I wanna thank each of them for joining us today and for their work in this field. The purpose of today's workshop is to take the next step, to work beyond the recognition of bias and, identity, and identify strategies and solutions to confront and lessen bias in our labs, our classrooms, and in the culture of science. We must accept being uncomfortable with these realities in order to move forward with solutions. And I'm heartened by the incredible turnout we had at the special symposium and at today's turnout at the workshop. Due to the many requests we've had, we're going to be recording the panelists' opening remarks and SDB will be releasing them as well as the talks from Thursday to make them broadly available. After our opening remarks, myself and Graciela will be passing audience questions to our panel and hope that we can have an engaging conversation. The discussion after the panelists' remarks will not be included in the recorded release of this session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of this workshop, Crystal Rogers. So Crystal is a prof um, assistant professor at UC Davis School of Veterinary and Medicine, and she serves on the board of directors of SDB as the PUI representative. 
Her lab focuses on understanding cranial neural crest formation, and she is assisted by her lab assistant, Chonk. And if you haven't met Chonk yet, I really recommend you follow Crystal on Twitter because he's featured broadly in her posts. Since beginning her career as a graduate student, Crystal has been a champion mentor to numerous undergraduate and graduate students, participating in programs that aim to increase opportunities for underrepresented minor minorities. While on the faculty at California State University Northridge, she mentored students in numerous programs such as MARC, Maximizing Access to Research Careers, RISE, the Research Initiative for Scientific Enhancement, and the Society for the Advancement of Chicano and Native American Students. This past September, Crystal moved to her current position at UC Davis Medicine, where she is faculty scholar of the Center for the Advancement of Multicultural Perspectives on Science and a mentor for UC Davis post back research education program. And she was recently featured at UC Davis responding to the ongoing injustices against Black Americans. In addition to her role on the board at SDB, Crystal is a mentor in the highly successful Choose Development Program, a pioneering program of the societies that aims to augment the diversity of undergraduate students that enter doctoral programs in fields related to developmental biology. So Crystal, thank you so much for chairing this uh, workshop and for the work that you do. And I'm going to pass the Zoom mic over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for coming. So thank you. I've prepared a statement that I'm going to read to you. Um, and then I will pass it over to our panelists. Thank you so much for coming to the Strategies to Lessen Biases in Science workshop at the 79th Annual SDB Virtual Meeting. My name is Crystal Rogers, as Nicole said, and I am an assistant professor at UC Davis. And I am currently, uh, but outgoing, the primarily undergraduate institution representative at the S on the SDB Board of Directors. Today, the organizers of this session, Graciela Unges and Nicole Diodosiu, have created a panel of science who, scientists who will share how they avoid or decrease bias in their own environments, and then we will take questions, comments, and suggestions from the audience. Our panel consists of myself, Dr. Mary Alice Scott, Associate Professor from New Mexico State University, Dr. Scott Gilbert, Professor Emeritus from Swarthmore College and the University of Helsinki, Dr. Carmen Domingo, the Dean of the College of Science and Engineering at San Francisco State University, and Dr. Barbara Lum, Professor from, from Davidson College. First, however, I want to share my own truth and why I agreed to participate in this panel. We are currently experiencing a global pandemic that seems to be getting worse by the day. I moved my lab to UC Davis in September 2019, and in March, we had to close and attempt to continue our research from home due to the pandemic. I know all of you can empathize with that experience. But in the month of June, I had to sit down and have a conversation with my five-year-old son describing to him that he and mommy are black, and because of that, we may be treated differently sometimes, that people might be mean to us. After hearing about the story of Breonna Taylor, a young woman who could have been me, being murdered in her own home, and after watching Ahmaud Arbery hunted and murdered like an animal for running in a neighborhood where people thought he didn't belong, I had to submit a manuscript to a journal. Then I watched George Floyd, a man who looks very much like my own father, get murdered by police in a callous instance of inhumanity. And I had to push the trauma down and finish my R01 and R21 submissions. When I moved from Cal State Northridge to Los from in Los Angeles to UC Davis, I had to ask black women in the community if my son would be safe in this rural area of California. They told me that it will be, quote, probably okay. When we bought our new house, the previous owners told all of their neighbors we were coming, and I'm so grateful that I don't have to worry about police being called on me while I'm walking the dog because I don't look like I belong. If you have never had to think about these things while you enjoy the privilege of doing the work you love, discovering how organisms are formed from a single cell, if you have never been the only person of your race or ethnicity in a room at a conference, and you are used to people looking like you, if you haven't constantly been confused for staff at events because people do not think you look like a scientist, if you don't think about being stopped by police every time you go to campus during off hours because you are worried they won't think you belong, and if you don't have to consider whether the community where you live will accept you before you even think of applying for positions, then you have privilege in this field and I'm asking for your help to make this space as welcoming, equitable, and inclusive as possible. 
I hope that we, as members of the Society for Developmental Biology, can be leaders for change, that we can improve not only our professional spaces, but that we can take what we learn into our communities and make a better world, that we can do these things because probably okay is not good enough. What is bias? The definition of bias is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. Bias is not limited to race. Rather, it extends to many different facets of one's being. I hope that we can come up with ways to reduce bias in every aspect of our community. Again, I'd like to thank you for coming to this workshop, and I will defer to the panelists to introduce themselves. Let's start with, uh, from my left, Scott Gilbert. You are muted, Scott. Thank you so much for your statement. Uh, I'll try to get this up here. Let's see. Can and very, you... very quickly, if, if all panelists could be seen, that would be great. The rest of us will undo our video. Okay, I'm gonna to try to finish this in 10 minutes. I wanna talk about making a flourishing environment, making an environment which has as little bias as possible. Uh, this is uh, the stage of rehearsal for Moby Dick at Harvard College, uh, Harvard University, which I was told is a great metaphor for a lab, a multicultural crew uh, on a quest. Uh, one of the things we have to concern ourselves with is this notion, whoops, this notion of being different, the sense of having a different background than anyone else, the feelings of being a fraud, an outsider, someone who can never fit in no matter how much one learns or does. And how does one prevent or relieve this syndrome? Our, our colleagues in English Lit have been dealing with this for about 50 years. And Judith Federley wrote a book called uh, The Resisting Reader, basically asking the question, why would a woman want to be a writer? American literature assumes that its writers and readers are male. The portrait of women, the portrayal of women, is from a masculine point of view that often reinforces and reproduces oppressive stereotypes. So women are put in the position of having to resist great American literature as untrue to their experience. We see this as scientists. Why would anyone want to be a scientist if scientists are white, Christian, male, and wealthy. Indeed, the Royal Society of London, which started science in the West, was white, male, Christian gentlemen who were honest and wealthy enough not to care about the outcome of the experiment. Often one sees on the websites things like this, you know, uh, you know biology branches and their fathers. Uh, these are the men, the fathers of biology. And this year, there were two papers published that uh, sent identical CVs to faculty members and identical CVs to managers saying, you know, uh, who would you want in your lab? Who would you give, what money would you give to incoming people with these CVs? Identical CVs and the physics and bio faculty chose white or Asian males and the vet managers gave males higher initial pay if they were to come there. Bias is certainly with us. Now, one of the things that I have to deal with as a textbook writer is how to present the field of developmental biology. One of the things we try to do is to show photographs which are inclusive so that Salome Glutzen Walsh, the woman who uh, helped found developmental biology, E.E. E. Just, uh, who was the expert on fertilization physiology, are mentioned as important people in the field. Also, chapters on sex determination and fertilization are reviewed by people such as Donna Haraway, Ann Fausto Sterling, and Alice Drager, uh, checking for discriminatory, sexist, and ableist language. So the book is vetted by these people. They tell me if the language is not good. I was thrilled to see in the introduction to Emily Martin's The Woman in the Body, uh, after I lectured to a class of second year medical students, for example, one of the women in the class told me that she had used Scott Gilbert's textbook, Developmental Biology in College Biology, and so had already realized several years ago that culturally bound images in biology are not only sexist, but bad as well. Yes, 
Okay, I was thrilled to know that this was getting, that that message was being told. In newer editions of the book, we have the bioconferences, uh, which uh, Michael Barrasi has organized. And you could see that women are represented, blacks are represented, uh, Latinos, Latinas are represented. Uh, this is important for us. Also within the book, uh, further developments, a social critique of fertilization research. So if people want to look at how biases are played out, it's there. Legends of the sperm are uh, talking about uh, fertilization as a hero myth. We tell the fertilization story as if it were a narrative of heroic performance. Some of the lessons that I've gleaned from talking and reading about this is that one can establish a culture of inclusive diversity when institutions make all the students feel welcome and that all the students are expected to succeed. Little things like micro affirmations, that they're doing a good job, smiles, just little things that say you belong here are important. As one of the questioners mentioned yesterday, getting students into the lab, especially their first year, is really important because that's when they know if they are, if, if science is what they want to do. I've had many students who come into the lab, they're great book learners, they come in and they find that science is working with their hands. That's not what they're used to. They're used to book learning. Oh, like 400 and I found attendees. What? Hello? And, and, and so uh, I also find that there are some book learners who come into the lab and say, if this is science, it's not for me. Often they become lawyers. Uh, funding first year research, I think is very important. It should be in the grant applications. It should be in scholarship packages. Uh, also recognizing that there are multiple ways of connecting the dots of data and that different cultures can tell different and scientifically valid stories is important. And that science is made poorer by allowing only one story to be told. For instance, that E.E. just talking about fertilization is not just male performance, but cooperation between male and female cells. The notion of symbiosis coming from Lynn Margulis, the notion of uh, the cells in one's body being the mitotic products of zygote mitosis uh, by Robert Remick, a Jewish scientist. These are critically important things to get people feeling that this is something that they can belong to. A motto of a Quaker minister friend of mine is engage respectfully and provide lovingly. And to teach respectful argumentation that being argued against is not an attack. It's part of a journey. It's to get somewhere. And that one should learn how to argument, have argument respectfully. Also, to relate to the student as a whole person and not just as a consumer of education, uh, to find out that your student is an artist or loves certain types of music uh, or certain types of sports. They are more than just who they are in the laboratory. And again, making them feel connected, making them feel that this is something they can do. Uh, I want to send out a thank you. One of the things that us developmental biologists know is that we have had to make a decision, sometimes a very traumatic decision, and that is to go into the field of developmental biology. Many of us can remember the talk we had with our parents about not going into med school, that we are not gonna be physicians, we're gonna be biologists, and finding that there's something in developmental biology that just fascinated us, that we had to find out about that was either aesthetically amazing or just something that an, a question we needed to answer. We often had to explain these things to our friends and parents. So thank you, especially those people who've had a more difficult time than others trying to convince their parents and friends that this was the right thing to do. Okay. Inclusion was the first problem. Second problem, what do you do when you find racist, sexist, or exclusionary language? Well, I go by the Hogwarts school of defense, and the first defense is the ridiculous, to defeat spells by laughter. 
the Women's Caucus of the Society for Developmental Biology, which included some of the most important feminist scientists on the planet, uh, made a book in the 1970s, one of the first feminist critiques of biology called Sexism Satis Satirized, where they took quotations from biological literature and made cartoons of them. It was a wonderful book. Also, uh, some of you might have seen this, Why Map the Why? Uh, Jane Grishmer's, Grishmer's uh, uh, science uh, letter, which was a satire on the very popular Stanley and Benbow uh, article on finding the math gene on the Y chromosome. And so she found all sorts of genes uh, for channel flipping, the ability to remember jokes, air guitar, uh, inability to express affection over the telephone. Uh, so she made a satire of this association between ability to do math and a gene on the Y chromosome. Another one is to uh, talk, is to actually attack harmful spells. And again, this is the Finetti and Cantantum. Uh, I introduced myself in my intro bio course as their defense against the dark arts instructor. That's who I am. And I tell them that spells are being cast to make them think things that are not true. And I've reorganized my developmental biology, my uh, intro bio lectures around misconceptions of development. The big defense against falsehood, of course, the Protego is making a shield to destroy spells. And Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Do we have such things? What does developmental biology have to offer? And I'll claim that what developmental biology has to offer is the embryo. Ask yourself, what would the embryo do? The embryo has always been our teacher, says Victor Hamburger. So how does the embryo solves problems of part whole individual and community? The first is that difference is healthy and that difference does not have to be hierarchical. The first distinction of mammalian development is trophoblast or embryo, both are critical. Both need respect. You can't get one without the other and remain healthy. So difference is normative. It is healthy. Reciprocity, organ formation, is done by immature cells interacting with each other to mature each other. Think of the co-creation of the lens and the retina. The brain bulge goes to the epidermis and it changes the epidermis, that immature epidermis, into lens rather than skin. And as that lens is being formed, it tells that immature, those immature cells of the brain to become the retina. Two cell types interacting with each other. Nothing is self-made, it's done by reciprocity. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. Octavia Butler. A team or a body is a cooperative entity that can compete or cooperate. There's competition in embryo, and that is for scarce resources, but not usually against one another. So the notion that uh, many, are, many, many are called fewer chosen, sperm, myoblasts, axons, organ formation and evolution are balances of cooperation and competition. It isn't all competition. Nature and nurture also are shown in development to create less anxious lives later the demethylation of the glucocorticoid receptors in rats by grooming, the inheritance of anxiety through impaired grooming, that nurture is important. It actually changes gene expression in your body. These are questions, these are concepts that I've learned by talking with people outside the field, especially O, who is a Quaker minister who took my embryology class, Susan Curry, an ecological educator and activist, and we actually run a a uh, monthly meeting, uh, bodyearthsoul at gmail.com, should you wish to join. Uh, also, to see how a lab is run, Judy Sieber Thomas in our laboratory, and here is shown one of the labs. Uh, notice everyone is wearing the same t-shirt here. She had t-shirts made up for everybody. You can't hear the music, but this is also important, uh, kind of a, a do the right thing notion, uh, uh, which is, Music can get people together. And as long as it isn't very upsetting music, the, the students can play 
the music in the lab. Uh, poster 681 is uh, a continuation of the work that's seen in the background here. So I want to conclude by saying, remember also, it's not a pipeline. Hate that metaphor. Even if one does not become a professional scientist, learning biology is important. Working in the lab are important. Uh, here are a few former biology majors who have actually done some interesting and important things. Alice Paul, Wangari Matai, Gertrude Stein, uh, Alexander Yulinov, uh, Lenin's older, more radical brother. And I'll just leave you with some interesting things uh, uh, from uh, the paper by Gibbs and Griffin, that diversity in many respects improves research outcomes. And that further faculty diversity, diversity has been shown to improve learning outcomes for all students with a particularly positive influence on the retention and persistence of students from underrepresented backgrounds. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I, that was an excellent presentation. I would like to move on and um, introduce Dr. Carmen Domingo from San Francisco State. I need to get out of here just a moment. And who, how do I stop the screen? Okay, Jeff. Am I, okay. Am I off the share screen? Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to participate in this panel. You know, I really appreciate the opening remarks that, that Crystal shared that are really heartfelt and personal about her struggles and the struggles of other Black people in our country. And I also really enjoyed uh, Scott's uh, weaving of just the impact of uh, inclusivity and what it has on uh, both the profession of developmental biology, but broadly as well. Um, so I'm uh, Carmen Domingo, and I've been a professor at San Francisco State, which is a minority serving institution for quite some time. And just two years ago, I, I became uh, the college dean uh, of science and engineering. Uh, and Garcia likes to tease me because I've turned gray since then. <laughs> and, um, but I'd say, you know, it's, it's been an interesting experience for me to, to step into this, <laughs> into this role. Um, as you can imagine, there are very few Latinas that have this position. Uh, and it gives me an interesting perspective of some of the challenges that, that we have had in terms of building inclusive environments at, in academic institutions. Um, I think there's been lots of training, um, you know, in terms of uh, learning about our internal biases, um, understanding things like stereotype threat and so forth, but those individual trainings aren't helping our institutions change fast enough. And there's true frustration that programs like NIH Mark and RISE and ARACTA, which is setting in motion uh, you know, diversity, uh, and I think, again, this criticism of the pipeline, but it's not really translating to the type of diversity that we want to see in our academic institutions. Oh, yeah. um, and it's not, and we're not seeing it fast enough in the developmental biology society. We're starting to see it, and there's been efforts in supporting things like um, the Choose Development Fellows, and we're seeing more inclusion in terms of the speakers that we're inviting to talk. But yet, if, if you reflect, uh, the, the scientists of color in our society are still incredibly isolated. Uh, and that isolation is, is really, truly a challenge. Uh, there's, there's a term called inclusion tax that it's the additional energy that it takes for people of color to adhere to white spaces. Um, there's the cultural taxation of individuals of color taking on additional service uh, and activities by virtue of their small representation in a group. So they're often called to be part of committees and so forth. Um, and then there's the invisible labor because of the efforts that these individuals take on to mentor minority students or to serve, you know, again, like on committees, but it's, but it's not rewarded in the same way. So it takes time and effort. And yet if it's included in your research proposals, 
it, it's not really validated. Uh, it doesn't help us get research grants. Uh, it takes time away from research grants. It doesn't help us get the publications. It takes time away from publications. Um, and so these things add up and they make it incredibly difficult for someone to navigate um, success as defined uh, by our institutions uh, in terms of what, what does success look like uh, as a scientist, a scholar, and an academic. And so, you know, my, I'd like for us to consider what we need to do to make institutional changes so that we actually recognize uh, the value of this work, um, that we reflect on uh, the criteria that we use to hire faculty, for example. Oftentimes, the criteria there is often around a narrow area of research because uh, it will benefit other colleagues. What if we thought of criteria that benefited our students? Uh, if you consider the institutions that you come from, do the faculty represent the diversity of your student population? Uh, and the answer is no, right? Uh, we have, I'll just take California as an example, 50% uh, of the students finishing high school are Latinx. And yet, if you look at the faculty representation of Latinx, it is less than 7% faculty. These are things we really need to consider if we want to see the type of uh, enriching experiences um, for our future developmental biology uh, society. Um, I also wanted to point out that I think the society could uh, partner with our minority serving institutions. Um, it turns out that minority serving institutions provide one fifth of all STEM degrees in the country. 40% of all Hispanics receiving degrees in STEM come from minority serving institutions. And about 20% of all African American students receiving STEM degrees come from HBCUs. So if we could strengthen the partnerships between uh, institutions, I think we can also strengthen um, the advancement of students in developmental biology as well as in other areas of expertise. Um, so anyways, I think I'll stop there and uh, give uh, time for the other uh, panelists to discuss things that are on their minds and then open it up for Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carmen. That, yeah. <laughs> That's all I can say is, yeah, all that. Um, and we have so many good questions coming in that um, I look forward to answering and getting to after everybody introduces themselves and their ideas. Um, I did want to say, that's what I want to say. So next, why don't we move to Dr. Barbara Lum um, from Davidson College, and she will give us, I guess, a, an abbreviated version of something that she presented at the Southeast Regional um, regarding this topic. Actually, she might not be here anymore. Okay, so in that case, what we'll do is we'll move to Dr. Mary Alice Scott, who presented um, in the original, the first bias uh, um, panel, which was an amazing presentation. And um, Mary Alice, take it away. All right, thank you. I'm going to share my screen because I, I want to just very briefly share a framework that I have started using um, recently that, that um, might be helpful in terms of thinking about how we um, how we might go about addressing some of these really um, huge uh, issues um, that, that everyone else has already brought up. So let me share this. Okay. Um, so just really briefly, if people weren't at the session on Thursday, I'm Mary Alice Scott. I'm a medical anthropologist at New Mexico State University. And a lot of my research has been in um, 
the looking at the culture culture of medicine and medical education um, specifically. So what I want to talk about just really briefly today is the second step of a longitudinal um, research project in collaboration with um, with uh, gra graduate medical education programs. So um, as I mentioned in my um, talk yesterday, one of the things that came up in the original research, ethnographic research that I did um, in graduate medical education um, was that bias at a number of different levels um, was a real problem for in, in a lot of different ways. Um, it was a problem in terms of who, um, who goes into medicine, it was a problem in terms of what people's experiences were in the learning process, um, it was a problem in terms of what gets, what gets taught in medicine. Um, and so, um, so the second step of this, um, of this project that we've been working on is to figure out what we do about it. And that was something that came up in the questions um, on Thursday as well is, okay, yeah, these are big problems and what do we, what do, we do? So I just want to offer as, as one um, possib possibility a framework that I've been learning about. I did not develop this framework and I'm going to acknowledge the people who did uh, on the last slide. Um, but what, I've, what I have done with it is try to translate it to a university setting because it was originally developed for uh, medical education settings. So this structural competency framework is really about trying to um, support health equity um, and, and and to train physicians to be able to support and, and enhance and produce um, in some way more equitable um, health environments and, and more health equity in general for, um, for populations. So the, the way this framework is divided up is that it works at multiple different levels. Many of these levels are overlapping, um, but it's a, it's a way to try to kind of break things down a little bit to identify very specific ways that we can intervene in these different levels. So um, the levels are individual, interpersonal, institutional, community, policy, and research. So what I want to do is just give a couple of ideas about things we can do at each of these different levels. And um, actually, uh, Crystal and Scott and Carmen have all already um, given examples of some of the things that we can, that we can do um, at these different levels as well. So the, the individual level, the, the first, uh, this is really focusing on yourself and what you can do. So you can educate yourself on implicit bias. Um, you can provide that education to other people um, in, your, in your lab um, or in your institution as well. And avoid moral judgments of student or colleague behavior. Really try to think about what assumptions you might be making about why people are doing the things that they're doing um, and, and instead um, try to understand those from a different perspective. Let's see. Sorry, it's not advancing. There we go. Um, at the interpersonal level, and this is, you know, between you and other people who you're working with. Um, I one of the things that I notice um, a lot in academia is language barriers, not just in terms of speaking different um, languages like Spanish and English, but also in using academic language that may not yet be accessible um, to, to some of your students or staff um, in where you're working. And so really thinking about addressing language barriers using real language um, so that you can um, really effectively communicate across um, a number of different groups of people who may have different experiences and come with different sets of vocabularies. Um, and, and recognize that different ways of speaking are valid um, ways of speaking, even if they don't use the academic um, or technical jargon that you use. Um, recognizing power imbalances between you and those you work with and shift them when you can. Um, pay attention to who speaks and who doesn't. Figure out ways to create a space for everyone to contribute. And we can talk about maybe some more specific ways these things could happen um, in the discussion. At the institutional level, um, Carmen spoke to this, I think, um, uh, directly. Um, but the, at the university level, but there are other things to restructuring your lab space um, to be able to uh, meet the needs of students, staff and colleagues, ask your students and staff and colleagues what they need to be able to do the work that they want to do, or that they need to do in your lab and really work to address those needs. Um, pay attention to who's able to attend meetings or other research activities find out why some might be unable to. Because I think we make a lot of times make assumptions. And I think um, one of the things that Crystal brought up 
um, in, in her words at the beginning was, you know, if you're having a meeting after hours, are there people who feel uncomfortable walking across campus um, in the evening for a meeting? Um, if you are someone who has not experienced that, then you may be completely unaware that that's an experience that people have. So find out um, what, what's going on. Um, at the community level, I was thinking, I think generally about our professional organization. So thinking about um, as um, uh, uh, Carmen brought this up as well, um, creating opportunities for people who are less often heard in your professional organization to speak. Um, partner with other organizations who are working on similar issues that you are concerned about. Bring, so bringing those um, kind of voices from other places in, diversify leadership. There are all kinds of other things that, that um, we could do. Um, but those are some just examples. Um, at the policy level, I think, you know, one of the ways that bias happens is it is written into our policies. It's written into the ways we hire. It's written into how we evaluate um, for tenure and promotion. It's written into the policies of our lab. What are the expectations of, of, of students or staff or our colleagues in our labs? And I think that we could, uh, I think it's, it's worth it to examine those policies and identify ways that they may perpetuate bias. I think writing op-eds and policy position papers to talk about what's happening um, in universities and really get the conversation out um, more publicly is important if you are in a position where you can do that. And I recognize that not everyone is in a position to be able to have that kind of a public critical voice um, about the policies of our institutions. Um, schedule meetings with people who can change the policies that you see as problematic or change them yourself if you can. Um, and then the last, the last level real quickly that I wanted to talk about is, is, re, is our research. Um, and I think some of this is just taking the time to reflect on how we're doing our research, thinking about what, what assumptions may underlie research and the ways that we communicate it. Think about the metaphors you use to describe your work. Question whether you might be making bigger leaps than your data would suggest by using assumptions that you have about how the world works. Um, so, so those are just some, some ideas. And again, like I said at the beginning, this, is, this general framework is not one that I developed myself. Um, it was developed by the Structural Competency Working Group and in particular by, um, initially by Jonathan Metzl and Helena Hansen. And then I was specifically trained in this framework by Miriam Magana Lopez and Seth Holmes. So I just wanna acknowledge that um, their um, contributions to the development of this work. And I will stop there. Thank you so much, Mary Alice. Those are really great ideas. And I do think that we have uh, some structure or time later to talk about how we can implement some of those things. And in fact, uh, one of the things you said was really striking to a comment made by Joan Hooper, uh, that they are actually changing their promotion rules to elevate the excellence in service to the same status as excellence in teaching research clinical criteria for faculty promotions. And I think that that's a big deal. Um, and I hope we can really get in, dig deep in this because that's where the, the things are going to change. Um, and so I do, so thank you for that. And then I did want to um, move to Barbara Long. She came back. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourself and telling us what you had to tell us, and then we can get dig deep into the questions and the, the topics. Great, thank you. Um, it's really nice to see so many folks here today and acknowledging um, that word bias has to happen on many, many different levels. Um, I have been teaching developmental biology at Davidson College, a small private liberal arts college near Charlotte, North Carolina for the last 20 years. And I'm also the director of our HHMI funded inclusive excellence project. Um, and the example that I wanna share today is quite small. It's absolutely on the individual level. And I, uh, it just as an example of identifying my own biases and why reaching out and interacting with folks in other disciplines has been helpful for me in teaching developmental biology. But I do want to acknowledge that institutional policy level change is absolutely critically important for really meaningful cultural change. So let me share a couple slides with you showing an example of my own biases in my own teaching. And so, can you see the slides? Um, so, as, as a group of developmental biologists, we all know that developmental outcomes vary. Even under very tightly controlled conditions, we see differences in how our embryos develop. 
And many of us will often discuss how human manifestations of development are related to that. It might be the gene family that we're working on and how that gene family um, is implicated in human disease or health, for example. We may give examples in our classes of when developmental outcomes look different because of environmental factors. And part of what I've learned um, the real advantage of being at a small liberal arts college is you really get to interact with folks outside your discipline because you're usually the only developmental biologist in town. And one of my colleagues in the English department is a disability scholar, Anne Fox, and she shared with me this statement from disability activism, nothing about us without us. And that statement extends to lots of other marginalized groups as well. Don't do something for us without asking us. Think about us, make sure our voices are parts of the conversation. And I realized I wasn't making voices part of the conversations when I was talking about human manifestations of development. And so one day, Anne flipped me this New York Times opinion piece by her friend and colleague, Rosemary Garland Thompson, who has, um, you would say that the developmental outcomes of her limbs are different than what um, was the case for most of us. And she wrote this lovely short editorial in the New York Times a few years ago in which, and I have found that was one very simple way to bring into my developmental biology course, the voice of um, a, another voice that wasn't present in the room. And so she said, I, Not to interrupt you, but we can't see your slides fully. So if you can maximize that. Yeah. Before me, you start going. Thank you. Let me try this again. Is that better? Great. So what Rosemary said was she was subject to plenty of unsavory terms. The most disagreeable and persistent was birth defect and that she was glad to now have rare genetic condition instead of birth defect because she said anything rare has prestige. And I thought to myself, how many times in teaching development biology have I used that term birth defect? And how much do I work on trying not to say it and it comes out? And so thinking about that, I'm going to share one example of a slide from teaching limb development. Um, can you see the new slide? Okay. So um, in a you know, lesson on limb development, um, this slide is preceded by a slide from Scott's textbook showing chick limbs and the TBX4 and 5 transcription factors. Um, that differentially control forelimb versus hindlimb. I think it's really interesting, beautiful stuff. And then, you know, this sort of next slide in class would say, oh, and by the way, a mutation in TBX5 has been associated with holt orem syndrome in humans. And it's a pretty simple, straightforward slide. And when I looked at it in seven bullet points, I found that I used seven examples of ableism in this really small, really small slide that was maybe five minutes in class. And so what could I do? So, and I, you know, I care, have to say I used that slide for many years. Um, and now I can change that slide a little bit and I will, I'm sure my slides will continue to evolve as all of us who teach do. And instead of saying mutation in TBX5, which can have a negative connotation, especially for new students, because the word mutation outside of science has a lot more negative implications to it. And to say premature stop codon, not only do I take away the potentially negative connotation, I've given more information by telling you how the sequence has changed. Instead of saying abnormal forelimbs, just saying shorter or absent forelimbs. Again, more information, less ableism, and so on. And so I've been trying to think about the words that I'm using in my teaching and also the images. If you look at the images on the before slide on the left, they're very clinical, just showing body parts. And five, 10 minutes Googling got me these three images that I could share with my class, showing you know, a, a mother and son swimming, a football player, a young baby that's clearly um, gotten quite a bit of affection and showing that it's not just body parts. And I will say that my first inclination was, well, the images on the left protect identity, but the, they don't show you humanity and the images on the right hopefully show my students a little bit more about the range and sort of lives of folks with holt Orem syndrome. And I will say I was worried about this change and I just, I wanted to make sure that I, 
I didn't want to miss the mark because many of us have good intentions, but our impact can land in a very different place. And so one small piece of advice I have is to ask for feedback. So I took this very slide to my colleague, Ann Fox, and said, what do you think? I wanted to make sure that I wasn't being a, slot, a you know, sort of sideshow situation here. And what she said is she said, these are from, these are people who shared their stories very publicly. Um, that is, you know, that is absolutely something you can do here. Um, and so that was good to know that I at least with, you know, had an extra set of eyes to help me think about intent versus impact. And I want to point out my colleague and friend Karen Hale is also at Davidson, um, has published very recently in Cell Biology Education and a really nice paper thinking about language and word choice in teaching genetics. Um, and much of it, almost all of it, applies to developmental biology as well. And what she says, and she's been a, another really helpful friend and colleague, is to describe variations in genes and phenotypes neutrally. Instead of using you know, disorder or disease, use variant, use affected, use expressed. Those types of words can reduce ableism. And also to avoid assuming normality. Instead of saying normal or abnormal, say typical or common, uncommon. Just thinking about those really small word choices. And I would also say help in, in this work, it's been helpful for me to have an accountability partner. So for example, crazy is a word I'm working on right now. My assistant and I have an agreement that if either of us say it inappropriately, we're gonna call each other on it. So instead of my schedule being crazy, she will rephrase me and say, I think you mean it's busy or it's full. And so thinking about how can we do that in our teaching? You know, can I say to my students, I'm working on this, I need, I need your help, you know, is this, um, something that we can do together and here's why we're doing it and why it's hard and why I'm not perfect yet, But I'm doing my best to show that example So I really strongly recommend taking a peek at Karen's article It goes well beyond ableism to also talk about gender and race as well And then finally, I just wanted to give one small example um, about auditing ourselves and Ed Young wrote this piece in the Atlantic a couple years ago about trying to fix the gender imbalance in his stories. And what he did is he went through, he's a science writer for The Atlantic, you may know some of his work. And he was inspired by a colleague and tracked how many times he mentioned um, men versus women in his, in his writing about scientific discoveries. And he said, I can't overstate the importance of doing that spreadsheet. It is a vaccine against self-delusion. It hurt me from wrongly believing that all is well when he had the numbers. Um, and how they, he said he didn't think they'd be 50-50, but he was surprised at how far from 50-50 he was in that work. And I want to um, say that, again, this is one individual level small thing that we can do is track one thing you're doing. I went through all my slides in a semester in neuroscience class and said how many times, every time I show a picture of a human, um, male, female, other, or can't tell because sometimes your icons are very gender neutral and white non-white and where do I where do I fall and saw where I had work to do in some of those you know just very simple slides that I was using in class I think all of us can do this in some small way in some part of our work whether it's our citations our images our phrasing and finally I just want to end with a quote from this article from Ed where he said I knew that I cared about equality, so I deluded myself into thinking that I wasn't part of the problem. I assumed that my passive concern would be enough. Passive concern never is. So I'm glad that we have this opportunity today to talk about actions on different levels um, to reduce bias. So thank you.